chapter 4 and verse 13. Uh, this morning, you know, we are familiar with the idea of atheism. We're familiar with the word atheist and atheism. And uh, atheism simply says that there is no God. Uh, that, that, that God does not exist, that there is no God. And, uh, you know, there are some who say, you know, there may be a God, there may not be a God, but we simply can't know if God is there, if God exists, what God is like. And in spite of the proof that God indeed does exist, there are those who hold to that fact that there is no God, there's no God, there's no way that there can be a God, in spite of verses like Psalm 19.1. That says the heavens declare the glory of God. They still hold to the fact that there is no God. In spite of verses like Romans chapter 1 and verse 19. That that which may be known of God is manifest in the heavens and in them. There are still those who believe that there is no God. But do you know that there's a practical atheist as well? There's a practical atheist, and that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And I may very well indeed be talking to some practical atheists today. You see, the practical atheist lives life uh, like there is no God. It is a saved person. It's a born-again believer. It's a child of God. And uh, they believe in the existence of God, but live like there is no God. Think about it. They know that God is real. They know that God has saved them from their sins. And yet they ignore the God of the universe. That is practical atheism. And that's what I want to talk about. That's what James talks about uh, this morning. They disregard him as God and fail to invite him in our daily living. And so are there any practical atheists here this morning? Let's stand together and read in our text. James chapter 4 and verse 13, the Bible says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even, even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Let's bow together this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask, we beg you, God, to speak to our hearts this morning. We pray, God, that you would lead us to a closer walk with you, and you would lead us to things that we need to do in our walk with you this morning. Lord, we thank you for your salvation that you've given to us. And Lord, we pray if there's a person here that's lost, that they might be saved this morning before it's too late. God, convict us. We pray you'd add to your church this morning, if it be your will. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated this morning. Practical atheist, uh, that's what we're talking about this morning. A practical atheist may call on God in times of trouble. You know, when we get in a really tight pickle, we may want to guide our lives and we may want to call the shots in our lives. But when it gets right down to it and when we really are in a serious condition, then then we may call on God. That's what practical atheism is, because otherwise, if, if everything's going OK in our lives, uh, then we we don't really think about God a whole lot. We don't really think about calling on God if we are practicing practical atheism. And so let me ask you a few questions this morning to get us going. Do you seek to know the will and the way of God so that you can order your life according to the will of God and the word of God? Do you do that this morning? Do you say, God, speak to my heart so that I can know you more and so that I can walk in your ways? Do you say, God, uh, talk to me today through your word? And James shows us here a practical atheist. And listen, we get ourselves in all kinds of binds when we disregard God. Are there any witnesses in the house today? When we say, you know, we don't need God in this decision. We don't need God's advice, his counsel in this. I'm going to tell you, we'll be in a world of 
of hurt and we'll be in a world uh, of trouble when we disregard God in our lives, in our plans. And so in our text, James gives us a businessman who is, he is planning for the future. He's got his sandals on. He's got his camels all loaded. They're ready to go. And uh, he has taken the map and he knows exactly where he wants to go because there's an economic boom there and they're going to make money. You say, well, what's wrong with that, preacher? Nothing wrong with planning for the future. Let me be clear with that up front. You need to plan for your future. But James is going to tell us how to do that and where the problem comes. So I want you to notice two things with me this morning. Notice, first of all, a caution against independent living. Uh, there's a caution here with James against independent living. And what I mean by that is, I, this is my life and I'll do with it what I want to. I don't need any help from you or anybody else. I can do this thing on my own. There's a caution against that mindset. There's a caution against independent living. Now, as I've said, there's nothing wrong with making plans. Solomon talked about the ant and how the ant planned. Jesus talked about how we should count the cost. But here's the problem. You ready? Don't make your plans without God. Don't assume and don't make plans without God. Listen, plan for college. Young person, plan for college. Plan for retirement. Plan for the future. But here's the point. Don't leave God out of your planning. Put God into those decisions. Use his wisdom and ask for his leadership in your life and in those times of decision. And, uh, you, you know, he uh, rebuked making plans apart from a constant awareness of the hand of God and our own limitation. Look in verse 13 what he says. He says there, go to now ye that say. So evidently some of them were saying this. And I believe in my heart there's some saying it this morning. Right here in this service. He says, go to now. Let me tell you what that means. He's saying, now look here. Mom ever say that to you? Now look here. Grandma ever get you and say, now look here. Come here. This is what he's saying. He's saying, come here. Now look here. And it implies, when you heard grandma say that or mama say that, immediately what did it imply? She ain't happy, right? <laughs> Disapproval. Come to now. He is implying his disapproval. And he intended with that phrase to get our attention, to get their attention. And he's speaking to those who have it all figured out. I, we may have some of those in here this morning. I don't know. That you have it all figured out in life. You know exactly what's going to happen. You know exactly what you want life to be like. You know exactly how everything should work together in your life. But there are two truths that I want to give to you this morning about the future. Here's the first truth. God knows the future. Here's the second truth. We don't know the future. Just as simple as that. God knows. We don't know. And so we must involve him. How foolish it would be to not involve the one person who knows what the future holds, right? To not seek his advice and seek his counsel and seek his will. And everything in their plans, in verse 13, everything was about worldly gain. Never do they say, we're going to do this or that for the glory of God. But it's all about what they can gain. They never say, we're going to do this for the extension of the kingdom of God. Notice in verse 13, they say there, Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell. And notice this, and get gain. We're going to make a profit in this. And here's, here's our plan. And you say, well, preacher, that sounds like a pretty good business model to me. Listen, that may be a good business model. Uh, it may be a great business model, but it leaves out the most important person. And that's Almighty God. It leaves out the most important person. And notice, notice he says the timing here. He says today or tomorrow. Today or tomorrow, that's our timeline. But I want you to understand this. Life is so uncertain. Life is so fragile, isn't it? That literally we are here today and we're gone 
in the next breath. Life is so uncertain. It is so fragile. In fact, Proverbs 27, 1, Solomon said this, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. We don't know what's going to happen this afternoon, much less what's going to happen tomorrow. Much less in their business model what would happen a year from now. And that's what they talked about here in verse 13. And so notice the place. They had the place uh, mapped out. They took the map out, they spread it out, and they pointed to the city, and they put a pin in it, and they said, here's a growing city, here is a thriving city, and it's a good spot for us to take our business. Notice the duration. They were going to stay there a year, and they were going to come back rich. They were going to get gain. And they take out the calculator, and they conclude, we're going to make a good profit in this city. Notice they were leaning on their own understanding and they left God out. Now let me ask you this question and I'll move on. Do we really want to be in control of our life? We can't even add one cubit to our stature. We're so frail. We're so weak. We're so, life is so uncertain. Do we really want to be the one who is in control? Now, here's the second thing about independent living. Number, the first thing was don't make plans without God. Here's the second thing about independent living. Don't fail to recognize the uncertainty of life. The uncertainty of life. And it seems like so much lately here we're reminded of the uncertainty of life, aren't we? Life is fragile. There, there, there is a, there's a funeral service this afternoon of a former pastor here. Life is uncertain at best. And you say, well, I got a long time till I got to worry about dying. You don't know that. Notice he says in verse 14, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then it vanisheth away. He said, he's asking the pointed questions here again. He's saying, consider the frailty of your life. We don't know what will happen tomorrow, much less a year from now. W.A. Criswell said there must have been a kindness and a goodness of God in veiling the future from our eyes. For if a man knew what the morrow would bring, he would live in a constant fear and foreboding. Dying, he would die a thousand times waiting on that time that he knew was coming. He would die a thousand deaths before dying just once. Fainting, he would faint a thousand times before he came under the stroke of that faint. So listen, here's the, here's, the un, here's the frailty of life. Men have choked on a grape stone. Men have, there have been stories of people being killed by a tile falling from the ceiling. Poisoned by just a little drop. I think it's Spurgeon who said this, it's a marvel that man even lives at all. Think about all the things in your life that could have taken you out, but here you are. But listen, think about all of the things that still can take you out. Because life is so uncertain. We don't know what is coming. The Bible says, talks about life like this, and he says here it's a vapor, which is a shadow. It's a figure of speech in the Old Testament. It's like a puff of smoke. It appears and then it vanishes. It's like the morning dew. It's there and then it's not. Life is short. The Bible describes life like this. It's a shadow that declineth. It's a breath. It is grass that is withering away. It is few days and full of trouble. That's how the Bible describes the vapor of our life. We all have an hourglass hanging over our head. We, all, we, we don't know what tomorrow will hold. Here's something good I, I, I uh, liked. When as a child, I laughed and wept, time crept. That's how, well, I remember that. And I thought I'd never get 18 years old. When as a youth, I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. 
When older still I grew, time flew. Soon I shall find in passing on that time is gone. What is your life? It's a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. Get God in your plans. Get God in your plans. And understand this, that our life is fleeting. Whatever we're going to do in our life, we must do it while there is time. We must do it now. Here's the third thing about independent living. Don't fail to acknowledge God. Don't fail to acknowledge God. Look in verse 15 at what it says. In verse 15, for that ye ought to say, and I believe my grandma could have wrote this verse in the Bible. This is where she got it from. But every time I'd say, Grandma, I'm going to do this. You know what she'd say? If the Lord will. If the Lord will. She's telling me, include your plans. Acknowledge God. And he says here in verse 15, For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If the Lord will, we'll go to this city and we will stay there a year and we'll buy and sell and get gain. If the Lord will. That's what you ought to say. That's what James is saying here. We think we can go anywhere we want, do anything we want for however long, and not be subject to the will of God. What he's saying is make all plans in light of His will. Let me ask you, are you doing that, child of God? Are you making all your plans in light of His will? Every transaction that you make, are you, are you making financial decisions based on the will of God? Based on the plans of God, the place where you work? Are you, are you praying about that place? Are you praying about the decisions of your family? And he says you ought to say, not an, this is not an excuse to do nothing. This is not just a saying of empty words. But he's saying this should be the desire of our hearts. If the Lord will, we shall do this or we shall do that. If the Lord will. Listen, we can't sit on a bench somewhere and just our whole life say, well, the Lord's never willed. Now the Lord does will. But he's saying pray the will of God. Now listen, God's will is always good and acceptable and perfect. That's what Paul said. God's will, we'd choose it if we had wisdom and knowledge and if we were wise enough to choose it, we'd choose the will of God. We, we should desire the will of God because it is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul knew this and he lived by it. Let me give you three verses. Acts chapter 18 and verse 21. It says, But bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you. Notice what Paul says. If God will... And he sailed from Ephesus, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 19. But I will come to you shortly, notice this, if the Lord will. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 7, he says, For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. What a way to live our lives. Listen, I don't care how old you are this morning, how young you are. We all need this message. We need to acknowledge God in how and what we do. What a message. And then notice the fourth thing about independent living. He says, don't fail to realize that living independently is sin. In verse 16, he says, but now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. They're bragging about it. <laughs> they're bragging about what they're doing and the plans that they're making and they're boasting about it. They, they're taking pride in their ability to map out this, this thing in their life. Let me tell you, child of God, if we're not careful, we will take pride in our ability to map out our lives. And he says, he talks about boasting. He's saying you're glorying all of your bragging about this, about what you're doing in your life. He says it is evil. It is wicked. And it makes no sense. That word is talked about the, the town quack. A wandering quack. Just making no sense. He says all such rejoicing. It's evil. It's wicked. And so he's telling, he's cautioning us here against independent 
living. Man, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to convey this the way it's on my heart. But especially you young people, listen to me. You want the best life? Include God in your plans. You want the best life? Acknowledge Him in everything you do. Don't just say, well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to marry them, and I'm going to go to that college, and I'm going to, or I'm going to go to this trade school, or I'm going to go right out of high school, and I'm going to do this. Listen, if the Lord wills, don't live independently because what you are, you're a practical atheist. You know God's there. He's your Savior, but you're living like He doesn't exist. Now notice secondly in this text, a, command, a challenge to independence living. You kind of got to look on the screen of your bulletin for that. There's a caution against independent living, but there is a challenge to independence living. And look at it in verse, look at it in verse 17 here. It's, it's easy. He says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. It's easy to talk dependence on God, but it's harder to live in dependence on God. Because we do like our own lives and we like to order our world. But truth, listen, when we understand the truth that that is sin to live independent of God and not independence of God. When, when we learn that truth, that truth brings responsibility. And guess what that does? It makes us accountable. And when we refuse to do that, here's what it is. It's sin. When we refuse to do that, we are accountable now. And our faith is proven by our action. Listen, it's not how much words you know or how much words you respect that puts you right with God. It's how much word you obey. It's how much word of God that you and I obey. And here's the point. We all know more than we do. <laughs> but uncertainty of life shouldn't paralyze us. But here's what we should do. We should find the good and we should do it. You say, well, I'm not going to come out the house because I don't know what tomorrow holds. And I'm afraid of what tomorrow holds. Listen, don't let that paralyze you because put your faith in a God who knows tomorrow and He's never failed you before and He's not going to start with you and He's not going to start today. He is a faithful God. Don't let that paralyze you, but... Put your faith in action and your fear will flee and find the good and do it. Notice he says to him that knoweth to do good. What is it, what's he talking about? Who's he talking to? He's talking about those who make plans in context. He's talking about those who make plans without God and then they brag about their plans. To, for him that knoweth to do good, and the word good means morally excellent and praiseworthy. It is morally excellent to seek the will of God and plan according to the will of God. So let me ask you, do you know God's will? Do you know God's will? You say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it. Okay. Are you doing it? You say, well, I got saved. Praise God. But there's more in Christianity than you getting saved. That's the start of your Christian walk. You say, well, I'm a member of the church. Praise the Lord. Here's the point. What is God's will for your life right now this morning? What's God want you to do today? What's God want you to do at this moment? moment in time do you know God's will if, if you don't you got to find it it's up to us to find the will of God we find the will of God through the scriptures and through the spirit but notice what he says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not refusing to, the, to do the will of God listen this isn't a problem with knowing the will of God this is a problem with rejecting the, the known will of God I told you knowing truth holds us accountable and makes us responsible. It's never enough to know what is good. We have to do what's good. 
Not enough to know what's good. And so when we don't, it is sin. And the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. What's God want you to do? Are you doing it? Do you know it? What does God want me to do? I'm going to tell you where peace comes, and I'm about done. Peace comes from getting in the will of God and doing the will of God. Got anybody here this morning troubled? Maybe you're troubled about the future. Maybe you're troubled, you just got unrest in your heart. There's no peace there. Let me ask you this question. Are you doing the will of God? Are you inviting God into your life, into your plans? Don't ignore God. I want you to know this this morning. God is real, and God has a will for each and every one of us in this place today. We find it through His Word. Maybe you're here this morning and maybe you're lost and you don't know the Lord as your Savior. Listen, your eternity can change today. Here's what God wills you to do. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord to save you this morning? Would you call on Him, your works aside, your religion aside, your, your ritual aside and say, Lord, I'm a great sinner, but you're a great Savior. And would you invite Him into your life and would you ask Him to save you and to forgive you and to cleanse you and to be the Lord of your life. And here's the thing, He'll do it today. If that's what you need, Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to Him it is sin. Would you come to the Lord Jesus today? Maybe you're saved, but maybe you're outside of the will of God. Maybe you're saved, but maybe you've been pulling all the strings in your life. Let God into your life. Let God into your plans. Are you living independent? Or are you living in dependence of God? Give up the rights to plan your life without God. As we get ready, let's have a song of invitation. This morning, I encourage you to put away your pride. Put away your pride and surrender and submit to the will of God. Submit to God's will for your life. Walk in it. You know what? God's will for your life may be next door. May be your neighbor. God's will for your life may be a coworker that you need to reach out to with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Find God's will and walk in it. Invite Him into your living and into your decisions and ask God to help you do what you know you should do because when we refuse to do what we know we should do, the Bible says it's sin. It's sin. Let's stand together this morning. <clears throat> All right, what number will we sing today? 542.